often ride public transit with my mom, both the bus and the subway. And as a child just trying to survive, I would often try my best to stand on the subway car without holding any onto anything while it was moving. I would try and master the turns, glide with the moves of the subway, cruising like a boss. This was, of course, against the nagging persistence of my mom, who would always be yelling, Eugenia, hold on to the safety rail. But I didn't need safety rails. I was a boss. Anyway, as I was carrying out my usual duties one day, the subway car came to a screeching halt. I miscalculated my usual stance, and instead of remaining standing, I went flying and smack into the floor. From then on, I held on to safety rails. Um, yeah. But for subway rides to come, the question was always deep inside of me. Why couldn't I stay standing? Why did I have to hold on to safety rails? It wasn't until a grade 11 physics class that I realized that I was experiencing Newton's first law, or the law of inertia, which states that an object at rest Whatever. remains at rest, or in motion, remains in motion at a constant velocity unless acted on by an external net force. The external net force in my case was a subway car coming to a stop. I snapped when I found this out. I was like, oh, inertia did this? Huh. Okay, huh. that's fine. And from grade 11 onwards, I would hold on to the safety rail, armed with new knowledge, knowing that the law of inertia wasn't gonna knock down this girl. Not today, inertia. And I would share this knowledge with any other fellow subway riders who had lost their balance along the way. I had no idea that my curiosity associated with riding the subway had anything to do with science. I just knew that it was happening to me, and I wanted to know why. Like any child, I was curious. I was born curious. And that bit of curiosity was starting to bud into this passion for science. I loved science growing up. I loved solving puzzles, building things. I loved any show that had to do with science. Bill Nye, I was in it. Magic School Bus, I watched that. Everything. I loved making science projects. Yes, even your cliche volcano, the paper mache one. But listen, mine was the best, so it's fine. I loved participating because for me, science was about figuring out the why to all of my questions. It was about exploration, it was about discovery, and sometimes it was about getting messy. But as I grew, I realized that my passion for science wasn't necessarily shared with the people around me. Um, I grew up in a low-income community in West Toronto, and many of my peers, like me, started off liking science. It was interesting, but after a while, the sentiment would always dramatically shift. I would start to hear things like, yo, science is too hard. Science is boring. I hate it. I don't want to go to science class. And science was turning away from this field of opportunity and interest to a subject that had to be mastered in school. And if the prospects of that were slim for whatever reason, you could not participate. I struggled too, because I was really trying to find my place in science. Do I belong, do I not? I remember when I would learn about the people responsible for the theories and discoveries that I was learning about, I wanted to know who they were. I wanted to know where they lived, where they came from. But as I began to research the people responsible for what I was learning, I realized that I wasn't part of that. You see, one day in my grade seven geography class, I had my science textbook and I decided to do a little flip. See if I could find anybody that looked like me, just one. And guess what? 
I couldn't find one person. Not one person. And this went beyond my textbooks. I wasn't seeing myself anywhere in science. I didn't know one black girl in science. I remember reading a lot of books. I watched a good amount of TV. And I think the closest version of representation that I had was Keisha from the Magic School Bus, the one with the puff puff that would always wear a purple sweater every day. Honestly, any time Keisha spoke, I was there. I was like, yes, what did you say? Tell Arnold, tell him. <laughs> I just, I, I held on to her because she was the only one out here doing science. And for a while, for a very long time, I genuinely believed that people like me just didn't exist in science. And how could I be something that didn't exist? So, this prevented me from having any lofty goals of being a scientist when I grew up. I continued it in high school and beyond because I had an African mother and I had to, and because I was genuinely interested in it. One day, I was in high school. I'm in the hallway, chilling. I have a science textbook with me because I loved it. And I'm just reading through it, and I bump into a student teacher. And she's like, oh, hey, you like science? I'm going through my own identity crisis with science, so I'm trying to play it off like, oh, yeah, science is all right. I don't know, oh, is a science textbook? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> oh, this is, I'm trying to play it off, but I loved science, and she's like, I can tell. You know what, there's a program at the local university, you should be part of it, it's called the Summer Mentorship Program. I was like, okay, okay, yeah, I'll do it. When's the deadline? She's like, tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So we ran, got my application together, put it through, I got in, and I gave it a shot. And that summer changed my life. I was not only exposed to science in brand new ways, but I suddenly had a community of peers, more than just one Keisha. <laughs> People that looked like me came from the community I came from, but from all over the city, all pursuing science, wanting to be doctors, wanting to be nurses. It was inspiring. And I also met doctors, nurses, researchers, and they were cool. They spoke to me. I came back from that experience, stepping into grade 12, like, I'm going into science. I could see myself in it for the first time, and I had this new level of confidence. I never thought that that unplanned hallway interaction with the student teacher would result in a shift from this general interest to a tangible opportunity, but it did. And serendipitous opportunities like that one led me on the path to pursuing a PhD in chemistry. Doing a PhD was a life-changing experience. I had the privilege to work in a lab and conduct real research. I mentored students. I supervised projects. Me. One of my projects involved working with an element a lanthanide on the bottom of the two, bottom two rows of the periodic table called terbium, number 65, look it up. And I worked with terbium and used its luminescent properties to develop detection tools that could potentially monitor disease processes such as cancer and Alzheimer's. It was so cool to be able to work in an environment where being wrong wasn't the end of the world, I had to constantly field questions like, hmm, what are you trying to show here? What's that? Uh, can you explain this experiment? There might be something more here. To be honest, sometimes I didn't know. So my answer would be something like, that's a very good question. Um, you see, what had happened was, is, but for anything I didn't know, I was driven to fill gaps in my knowledge with more knowledge. It's like science was constantly building on this foundation, and I was only scratching the surface of what I could know. It was an incredible experience. And it was super humbling 
to know that I had finally become the scientist that I never saw growing up but so desperately needed. But with this, I still struggled. Because my story, this journey from curiosity to a PhD in chemistry is awesome, but it is only one story. And I was always made to feel like I was an anomaly. Like, oh, you like science? Wow, good for you. You just continue doing that. Great. Not many people do that, like you, but good. Keep going. But I knew the power of the opportunities that I got. I knew that the opportunities that I had changed my mind, changed so many of the negative and incorrect perceptions that I had. So, I was left with the question, what am I gonna do? Because now I'm a PhD student working in a lab at a prominent university in Canada, realizing that not much has changed since I was in middle school. I still didn't see myself anywhere. I was the only one of me in a lot of my lectures, classes, and labs. I would go to international conferences and be asked, Oh, you're here for this conference? My friend, I'm presenting. Yes, I am. But, uh, but all of these personal realizations coincided with the rise of STEM learning. For those of you who have never heard of STEM, it, is, it stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, the importance of which has grown exponentially over the last number of years. You can't go anywhere without hearing about STEM. STEM is toted as the answer to our world's future problems. Research strongly indicates that youth must have early and positive experiences in STEM in order to be connected to critical thinking skills and future jobs. You have kids out here coding apps, running biotech companies. STEM is opening doors that were never possible when I was younger. It was awesome and I was all about it. I was part of it. But in knowing that, I also had to critically ask, but who is left out? who does not have access to these opportunities. Because when I grew up, and where I was growing up, where I still was during my PhD, I was still hearing the same sentiments that I heard when I was eight years old. That science is boring, that I don't want to be involved, that I don't want to be engaged. And there wasn't this same urgency to push youth in Capri as there was to push youth all over the world to pursue STEM. And I found that that was a problem. Youth from low-income communities are often left out of this conversation. Accessible opportunities, accessible STEM learning opportunities are hard to come by. Interestingly enough, very little research has been done on the implications of this in a Canadian context. But if we consider this city alone, that means that potentially thousands of youth are missing out. I felt indebted to use the platform of my PhD to do something about this. I would go into lab every day, loving it, being part of research, being humbled and honored to have this opportunity, and go back to my community and realize that if something doesn't change, I will be an anomaly. In 2011, I had the unique opportunity of volunteering with an organization that was doing work in this very area, Visions of Science. Today, I am the CEO of that organization and with a group of intelligent, brilliant people. Our mission is to empower youth from low-income communities through meaningful engagement in STEM. Thank you.
As an organization that is focused on working in this space, we acknowledge the barriers, the unique barriers faced by the youth that we work with. Barriers that are augmented when you consider race and gender. But beyond the barriers, we see vital community assets. Youth like Nawal and Arifa, two young black women that I had the privilege of meeting about four years ago in our community STEM clubs programs in one of our locations. They will tell you themselves that initially, they weren't even sure about their engagement in STEM or interest. They were reluctant to answer questions or ask them. But now, they are vocal, confident advocates for STEM who invest in their communities the same way that they were invested, giving opportunities to youth. And by providing free, accessible, and consistent STEM programming, we're making this impact with over 500 youth from 24 communities across the greater Toronto area, and we're just getting started. And as a leader of this incredible organization, I'm going to take this time to reject the deficit-based narratives that we are commonly inundated with, narratives that suggest that youth from low-income communities lack social capital and they are doomed for destruction without our intervention. Actually, we are doomed for destruction if we continue to underestimate and overlook the richness of potential that lies within each and every single one of these communities. Where, where are we gonna be if we do not empower youth like Nawal and Arifa? Youth who are resilient, industrious, bright, who deserve to have a chance and a choice at participating and remaining curious. I wanted to be part of that and to be able to go to work every day knowing that we're trying to change perceptions, it is incredible. And the sad thing is if you had told me when I was 12 that I would one day be working in a research lab on an element called terbium, I wouldn't have believed you and that is a problem. Science, technology, engineering, and math are not regulated to subjects that you learn at school. It's an endless field of opportunity and discovery, and everyone should be able to participate. But to me, STEM exists because of people who channel their curiosity into discovering and understanding the world around us, and to developing solutions to make it a better place. But that means that the people present matter. The people that are at those tables decide what gets researched, what gets developed, who it benefits. And we as a society have to become very uncomfortable when there are voices missing at the table. We have to become very uncomfortable when we create in the absence of who we really are. If I were to say the truth, if we could somehow know all of the youth, all of their locations, the youth who have the solutions to our world's future problems, if we knew where they lived, we would find them and give them everything they need. But unfortunately, it does not work that way. So we have the collective responsibility of dismantling the systemic barriers that exist to keep some youth in and some youth out of this field. When I think about the potential of the youth that we work with, I know that 
our future solutions, that the next Nobel Prize in some sort of chemistry or physics field is just germinating inside the mind of a youth that lives in a low-income community in Toronto, because I have no reason to believe that that's not true. And to those youth, to youth who have felt overlooked, who have felt like they don't deserve to be in a space because they don't see themselves, I want to say something to you in particular. Curiosity is your birthright. Have the courage to remain curious about the world around you. Have the courage to be curious about the problems that you see in your community. I don't know where that courage will lead you. Maybe it will lead you to finding out why you fall on the subway. But I already told you that's inertia, so that one was for free. <laughs> but maybe it will lead you to asking, what is artificial intelligence, and how do, I make, how do I use it to make the world a better place? Next, I would say, STEM needs you. We need you. You are the breakthrough that we have been waiting for. No pressure, but know that you can do this. I struggled so much with having the courage to share my story on platforms like this. Because it's mad awkward when things that make you painful, things that have embarrassed you in the past, people want to know about it. People want to hear about it. But as I've traveled, as I've journeyed, as I've had the privilege of going from curiosity to PhD, I know that being able to share my story is important. So the last thing I'll say is, when you get to wherever it is that you will get to, do not forget where you came from and the people that helped you get there. Because even though there is not a mold for you to fit into, you might need to become the mold for someone else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.